What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another Highly Combust Reaction. We're going to be jumping in the next one on our Bum Gardener Restoration Journey. Uh, the Savage Job. We already saw a little piece of this. We're going to be finishing it off today. Uh, let's jump into it. Let's check it out together. The man, we know he's got some ridiculous talent. Let's go. Let's see what we got. I can start to see the original and all of the repairs that were executed on it. And this is really what I was looking for. People say it's weird that I get kind of skeeved out about watching him do this when I know that he's a professional. It's just that I could never put myself, no matter how, it's not something that I don't believe that I could ever be talented enough to where I would feel comfortable doing it. That being said, I don't know everything that he's doing. So it is all unique to me. And some of it, you can't tell me. I know that he gets a lot of people to say, hey, it totally looks like you're about to damage this painting. Like, or I would be terrified to do that. It's that kind of skeeves me out. Like, I love watching the master at work. Most certainly go and show him some love on his channel because if you haven't been watching his stuff, like, you're missing out. Let's go. A clue as to what was done. I can see major paper patches applied to the back, indicating that the tears or damage that we could see on the face really did extend to the structural canvas. Oh. Sometimes lots of retouching on the face of a painting doesn't indicate any structural failures. But in this case, it seems that that is precisely what has happened. Major damage to the structure of the canvas and, of course, major damage to the image. So, finally, all three lining canvases. Three removed. lining canvases. It is now at this stage, with all of the lining canvases removed, that I can begin the process of removing the old adhesive from the original canvas. This is where I will introduce moisture. And I've chosen to use... Remember, up to this point, he has not introduced any kind of moisture that we've seen, aside from what he put on the gelatin on the front. Other than that, on the back side of this thing, we haven't seen that he peeled them all out by hand as as hardcore as that was. And I'm sure his hands were killing him. I'm sure at the end of it, though, it's all worthwhile. A synthetic clay water gel. Clay this is simply water. a powder mixed with water that turns water into a gel. I could use regular water and paint it on, but there's just simply less control and more saturation, and this that's something that I actually don't want. a very intriguing way to do The that. gel provides enough moisture that the rabbit skin glue will swell, but it doesn't provide too much that the canvas will become wet or saturated. Again, I'm looking to avoid any distortions. So once the gel has sat and the rabbit skin glue has swollen, I can take a scalpel and I can begin scraping it off. And in this case, I'm using a fairly dull scalpel, one from a previous project. I do save them after I've used them because they can come in handy. Using a brand new or very sharp scalpel would be counter to what I am trying to achieve here. I don't want to run the risk that I cut or gouge or damage the original canvas because it is incredibly old and brittle. I just want an edge that is sharp enough to scrape off the swollen gel and soft enough or smooth enough to glide over the surface without catching. Wow. Now, as I remove all of this, I notice, well, what was a seal on the back of the painting. At some point, this painting may have been part of a collection, and a wax seal was added to denote that. Unfortunately, it was completely removed during the lining process, and now all of that provenance, now that's gone. As I come to the areas of paper, I notice that there are one, two, sometimes even three layers of paper that have been adhered to the canvas, all with rabbit skin glue. It's a little bit more work to get each of these layers off because the paper just disintegrates and it gums up the edge of the scalpel. But I have time and there is no way to rush this. That, see, and he just said what I think is key to a lot of this stuff that people do with art. You can't rush it. People always want something fast. People always want a product delivered fast, or they want you to produce something fast. And a lot of times, fast isn't necessarily best. By this, I would not want anybody going fast at all. He's going literally 
it's almost like taking a toothpick to a piece of paper when you're just doing something that small and something that big. Like, it's very, very time-consuming. You could obviously tell he gets his cramps. You must. There's no way to do this without kind of cramping up at least once or twice. You would have to take massive breaks. I know that he does this over a wide range of time, but it's still, it's just the amount of effort, the amount of time, the amount of patience that it would take to do this is ridiculous. So by working slowly on the edge and letting the scalpel do the majority of the work, much like a drill bit or a saw blade does, I can get all of this paper off. And here, with the paper removed, is where we start to get our first glimpse at the true nature of the damage. I can see some tears, some really big holes where the canvas is absolutely missing. Things that I'm going to have to address later on. But first I have to clean up my table. I have been scraping for nearly a week. On and off, an hour here, an hour there. See? Because it's just too intense to scrape for an entire day it would be way too intense to scrape for an entire day i would pro personally me on my level that i'm at i would probably come kind of dread sometimes going back like i gotta go scrape some more of this stuff off but if it's something that you love something that you're passionate about like definitely is cool to see him i don't know kind of in his element kind of working that magic on the paintings very, very cool to see. Let's go. But what I have removed is quite impressive. I would say that there is at least two pounds of rabbit skin glue. Two pounds of glue. That have been removed. Two pounds. That was at legitimately adding weight to the painting like crazy. Just the glue. In the back of this painting. Though the scraping process was successful, there is still a thin film of rabbit skin glue on the painting. I don't want to use the gel again because it's not going to be as efficient as using an enzyme cleaner. This enzyme cleaner, brushed onto the canvas, will slowly break down the proteins in the rabbit skin glue. And then I can take a old toothbrush and gently go over the surface and loosen up all of that old rabbit skin glue. Once it's sufficiently loose, I can come back with a cotton ball and lift it off of the surface. One might ask why this is essential, and really, I want to get rid of all of the old materials that have started to deteriorate. Not only because they will continue to deteriorate, but because they can get in the way of the materials that I'm going to use when I treat this painting later on. And I want to make sure that I'm dealing with the canvas itself, not a layer of adhesive when I bond this canvas to a new lining. Makes sense. So, working in sections, I will slowly remove all of this residue, making sure that the canvas is all that remains. Nothing exciting here, just more removal of glue. Which seems to be a major theme in the conservator's life. <laughs> Now, with all of the adhesive removed, I can transfer the painting to the hot table, where I'm going to execute a treatment that has two functions. One, just to ensure that there are no remnants of adhesive left, and two, to relax and flatten the painting. Now, though I try, it is inevitable that whenever a painting has a lining removed and old rabbit skin glue removed, there is some distortion of the original canvas. And doing this treatment will ensure that the canvas is flat and smooth, and that any little remnants of rabbit skin glue are sucked down and out into this blotter paper. So using the large hot table is a real benefit here, because this painting is just a little bit too large for the small hot table. In addition, the larger hot table heats up faster and has a higher vacuum pressure that can be applied. So it will mean that the painting is exposed to moisture for a shorter duration and has a higher pressure applied to the surface, ensuring that it gets absolutely flat. I'll lay the painting down and make sure it's perfectly centered on the blotter paper, and then I'll cover it with the mylar film. I'll use tape to secure the mylar to the table, ensuring that it is complete and that there are no voids or gaps where the air could escape and compromise the vacuum that I want to create. 
Once it's secured down to the table, I can connect the hoses through the mylar, and these will extract the air, allowing the pressure to be applied. The pump goes on, and the air is sucked out through the hoses. The pressure is even and well distributed, ensuring that we get a nice smooth painting. But we can see that some of the areas where the fill-in was applied are bulging, which means that I'm going to have to remove those later on. Because the structural damage on this painting was significant to say the least, it's going to require a lining. And because this painting is old, the canvas is really fragile, I'm not taking any chances. I'm going to be doing an interleafed lining. And the first step is to apply this flat spun nylon gossamer to the back of the painting with an adhesive. This is a step that I take because it allows a little bit more adhesive to be used. This nylon gossamer, though very thin, does hold a little bit more adhesive. It's also incredibly strong, so it will allow me to handle the painting with a little bit more ease before the lining is applied. And that's something that I want because this canvas is so incredibly brittle. In addition, a piece of PET film will be coated front and back for the lining. Before the lining is executed, I want to remove the washikozo facing. It has served its purpose and protected and stabilized the paint layer during the removal of the old linings. But now it has no purpose and will just get in the way, and if I leave it on, it may be more difficult to remove later on. I'm using a brush with some warm water, and I'm going to apply it to the entire painting and allow that fish gelatin to swell and become soft. As easily as the facing goes on, unfortunately, it does not come off in no, the same manner. No, it does not. Manner. It comes off in shards. The washikozo, when fully saturated, starts to dissolve and comes off in little pieces as opposed to large squares. It is unfortunate, but it is really not a problem. Though it takes more time, I have time, and the painting isn't in any rush. So using a flat palette knife, I will slowly move across the painting and just peel back all of these layers. I'm not terribly concerned about any of the wash... I'm not terribly concerned about any remnants of fish gelatin adhered to the face of the painting. I'll remove that once I've gotten all of this paper off of the painting. It is interesting, having spent so many hours, so many weeks working on the painting without seeing the front, to see it again. I had forgotten what it had looked like. Truth be told, I had forgotten how much work was ahead of me. And as I remove all of this facing, I am realizing now that though I thought I was halfway done, the real work is just beginning. But that's okay. I have the time, and I like the challenge. We are here to salvage this painting, after all. And now we have come to the cleaning process. This is the most I've amazing process in the world that to there me. There is not a heavy layer of surface grime, but that there is a layer of discolored varnish. So using the appropriate solvents, which again I have tested to ensure that they do not cause harm to the painting, I'm using a rolled cotton swab, effectively a larger version of what we use at home, to remove this varnish. As the varnish comes in contact with the solvent, it softens, it swells, it dissolves and breaks down, and I can use the swab to lift it off of the canvas. I use a slight rolling motion as I move the swab across the canvas to lift up that old varnish. In addition, some of the overpainting is coming off with the varnish, a welcome relief, for that is often not the case, and more drastic measures are required to remove old retouching. With just this small section of the hand cleaned, we can see just how much of a difference there is. The old varnish has deteriorated over time, as is common with natural resin varnishes like Damar or Mastic and Shellac. The UV light turns them yellow, they become brittle, sometimes cloudy and cracked. And when we remove them, we can start to see what the artist really wanted us to see, the subtle, delicate variations of color 
Just being able to remove blip. just what you want to remove and not mess up the painting to me is something brilliant and something awesome. Meaning of the paint. Really the artist's mastery. All of that is concealed by old dirty varnish. And just working on this hand, I can tell that at once this painting was really stunning. If we look at the painting under UV light as sections of varnish are removed, we can see that the neon green haze that is the old varnish comes off, and the painting is revealed. We can also see lots and lots of overpainting, excessive retouching that, well, I'm going to have to remove as well. While this painting was profoundly damaged, not only through the tearing of the canvas and paint loss, but probably with the old conservation attempts as well, there are still some glimmers of really beautiful painting here. And the whole goal of this project is to salvage what can be saved, to bring back what may remain of the original painting, to undo all of this bad work and try to make it so that we can appreciate the talent of this artist. Now, cleaning the face was an area that I was both excited and very nervous about. The, pa the face does not look good now. Oh, man. And there is a ton. Really, just with that cotton swab revealed all kinds of damage. Of overpaint. It is essential that I remove that overpaint because it's discolored, it's incomplete, it's sloppy, and I can do better. Unfortunately, removing all of this overpaint reveals more damage. Much, much more than I had hoped. Anytime I work on a painting that's been previously conserved poorly, I always hope that what I find is good, positive, but usually it's not. Usually I find the overpaint has been excessive to hide the extent of the damage, and this painting is no exception. The bottom section of both eyes is completely missing. The there is no information there to work with. It's just gone. Like, this was a horribly damaged painting. It is completely missing. Much of the nose, you guessed it, completely missing. The lips are there, but they have been abraded and skinned so that they are, well, just a shadow of what they once were. But removing all of this is necessary, and it at least will give me a chance to put the painting back together in a way that is more appropriate and more sensitive to the artist. And again, under UV light, we can see these dark areas of purple all overpainting that needs to be removed. And the removal process is going to be multi-staged because some of this overpainting is water-based. It's a gouache or a tempera or a watercolor. And so I need to use a water-based medium to remove it. In addition, there is a lot of fill-in medium on this painting. In fact, there is fill-in medium on top of fill-in medium, on top of retouching, on top of fill-in medium, oh, no. on top of retouching, on top of fill-in medium, so on and so forth. There are so many layers to this, it is almost a wedding cake. So with ah. all of that first layer removed, I can now approach the second layer. And this requires a chemical solvent to soften up the fill-in medium, which appears to be white lead paint, and some of the overpaint. I apply this and I let it sit and soften up the white lead. And again, using the scalpel, just gliding over the surface and picking up the softened white lead, we can see how much overpaint there was and see how many different layers of fill-in medium and overpaint there were. In addition, we can see a little bit more of the original. A lot of the painting was simply covered up during the last retouching. Which is good. It means that the damage actually might be less than I had thought. 
If we remember back to the treatment on the hot table, I noted that there were some bulges that I would have to address. This was old fill-in medium that was removed when I removed all of the old retouching. Unfortunately, there was no canvas there. It had been cut clean, so I need to create an inlay to take its place. I'll trace the area onto a piece of canvas. I will cut it to fit and lay it down. This will ensure that I have a nice, stable surface onto which I can apply fill-in medium and execute my retouching. And with that, we have come to the conclusion of part one. We can see how the painting arrived in the studio, and through a lot of removal, we can see where the painting is now, ready for lining. I can't believe that there was no canvas there at all. It was just all fill-in medium. Lining That's crazy to me. Even when he first got it, the painting still looked like a painting. It might have looked like a damaged painting, but to us, it looked like a painting nonetheless. But there was just so much stuff there that it was kind of not supposed Just, I don't know. Very, very intriguing to watch Baumgartner do his thing, work his magic on these paintings 100%. If you guys enjoyed it, get over there, show him some love. I want to meet this man because that's way too much talent for any one man to have. I need to know where he got his wizard life skills. Because then you gotta know chemistry. You gotta know all kinds of stuff to do what he's doing as far as removing different different things that it could be. Could be lead-based paint. Let's try this thing to remove lead-based paint. But he's already been doing this for so long that he has that he knows, okay, that's probably this. That's probably this. That to me is a wealth of knowledge that somebody need to pick his brain. If you guys enjoyed it, go show him some love. Hit that like button if you liked it, the dislike button if you disliked it. Check out the other video up on screen or one of these guys. Until the next one, I'm highly combustible. You guys be happy, healthy, safe. Love you to the moon and back. Peace.